So, hello, everybody. Nice to be here and nice to have you here. Um, yeah, they pointed it out. I'm the developer of these systems and uh, I do speaker development now since 37 years. Uh, I recognized and life is short. <laughs> uh, um, so, what was the goal of these constructions? We have three models, three mastering studio monitors uh, in our program. This is the little one, the NF3, the MF4, and there is a bigger one, the MF2, which is used in the Sony Music Studios in Tokyo in uh, 12 mastering suites. And now they uh, will uh, update uh, these monitors uh, from the year 2000 by this new update. And this includes new drivers and new filters, especially new drivers. I want to say at first some words in general about the loudspeaker development and the goal of this construction. It is different to build and develop a loudspeaker than, let's say, a piano or a violin. Because nobody knows what is a perfect sound in a violin or in a piano. You have different sounds and for this music this piano is good and for another music another piano is good. In speaker building it's different and that's why we know what is an ideal speaker? The ideal speaker would be infinite small, reproducing 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with every level and without distortion. That's the goal. If I could achieve it, my job end. <laughs> and, but you see, they are not infinite small. Uh, so we still need to have some membrane area, some surface area to generate low frequencies and these also high frequencies. And because we are not able to build it with one way, which would be close to, uh, to the, to the uh, ideal, uh, we have to choose at least two ways. And many manufacturers choose three or four or even more ways to reproduce the whole spectrum. And I decided many years ago, as I started uh, with the development of loudspeakers, to build up only two-way systems with the idea to to have a homogeneous dispersion pattern so that the directivity index rises with the frequency slowly from a very low level to a higher level but without any strong deviation from a, from a, 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 a slightly rising directivity index. This is an important fact um, because the relation between the direct radiated sound on your listening place and the room answer depends strongly not only from your room acoustic but also from the dispersion pattern of the loudspeaker. And so if the directivity index rises slightly but continuously over the frequency range, it's much better for the sound colors, for the reproduction of sound colors, and it's much easier to equalize also. So that's one of the reasons why I choose to build up only two-way systems. With three-way systems, it's also it's it's already quite difficult to achieve a real good continuously rising directivity index. So two ways, but this has a lot of consequences on the technical side regarding the membranes, the motors, and so on. Because let's take this example of the MF4 monitor. This driver goes up to 1,200 hertz, and to build up a woofer, a 12-inch woofer, which is capable to reproduce 1,000 hertz and more with very low distortion and uh, clean behavior in every aspect is not so easy to achieve. And the same is for the compression driver and the horn. To bring this horn down, this relatively small horn down to 1,200 hertz together with the compression driver is also not so easy to achieve. So this means a lot of technical consequences on the side of the, the drivers itself and the horns or other elements. And to do that offers us this continuously rising directivity index, which is really an important thing in loudspeaker building. What was the further goals of these constructions? Today we have a situation 
most of the monitoring systems in studios using active monitors. You have integrated mostly Class D amplifiers and the DSP platform, which gives you a filter, which gives you group delay compensation, and which uh, gives you the possibility to equalize the speaker so that the direct radiated sound is in a high uh, degree linear. This is very good. And if we compare what we can get today, let's say, for two or three thousand pounds with such active speakers and compare it to 20 years ago, the level of reproduction quality is much bigger today and much higher today than it was before. But there are limits of that what we can do by using DSPs. And these limits are given in the dynamical behavior of the speaker. There we have no chance to correct anything. And if we look to that, what most of the manufacturers do today, how to linearize their system regarding frequency response, but also regarding um, other aspects, then you see that they choose surroundings around the membrane and also inside the driver, the spider, which is uh, the compliance of, of, of the woofer, they use these two elements to linearize the systems. The most impressive example for this is maybe Dynaudio. And some of you may have experience with these monitors. If you go below a certain level, it feels almost compressed, the sound image. Then you have to play louder and the dynamic starts to become good. And sometimes if you play it really loud, it's OK. But beneath a certain level, you have a strong impression of compression. And this impression is also given at, at mid and high volumes too. And what to do to avoid this? It's to reduce the mechanical losses within the system. And this is made especially here. This is one of the main parts. This is the surrounding of this woofer. And this surrounding has almost no mechanical resistance. So the mechanical resistance together with the moving mass builds an integrator. And as smaller the mass is and as smaller the mechanical resistances are smaller are these compression effects given by this integrator. But to reduce membrane mass means mostly that the membrane starts to generate partial uh, uh, movements within the, uh, within the membrane, which leads to distortion. So it would be nice to have a thicker membrane, more heavy membrane, and but then you have the problem of disintegration. And the other aspect is the motor system itself. This is the second source besides this mechanical resistance in the surrounding and in the spider. The losses in there are electromechanically induced distortions. You have a voice coil. And if a current flows through this voice coil, it generates the magnetic field, which then interacts with the permanent magnetic field inside the motor system. So you have around this voice coil many magnetically relevant materials like steel and ferrite or neodymium or whatever it is. And so the voice coil induces so-called eddy currents in this surrounding uh, metal parts. And these eddy currents then leads to losses which appears like mechanical losses. And this is not only a source for this integration and compression effects, but it's also a direct source for harmonic and non-harmonic distortions. And with this uh, two new drivers, this is the 12 inch and then the 50 inch, we have now a technology around a strongly reduced voice coil. So the inductivity of the voice coil is strongly reduced, and therefore the eddy currents we generate are much reduced. And so the dynamical behavior of this uh, new type of woofers is much improved to com compared to every woofer on this planet I know until today. And uh, in terms, uh, now here we have total harmonic distortion of 0.3%. In fact, it's lower. It's around 0 0.1, 0.15%. Uh, we define this value to make sure that we always meet the specs. But it's extraordinarily low. And these are only the total harmonic distortion. If you look to the nonlinear distortions, the non-harmonic distortions, the situation is more dramatic, different. The 
harmonic distortion in this woofer is compared to the woofers I used before, which are mainly TAT technical audio devices, woofers I used in special versions in the earlier constructions. It's reduced by a factor of five, uh, f f around five, four to five. <coughs> so regarding resolution, lower compression effects, all the dynamic uh, aspects, this woofer offers really something new, a new experience, I would say. And let me point out a second aspect which is of high importance for these constructions. Looking to the history of loudspeaker building, we have especially one, not only one of course, but I want to mention only one really important construction, which was the Bowes and Wilkins, the 801, coming out in the 80s. Some of you know the speakers, I assume. And if you look from the side to the speaker, you see the woofer, and then a step back, you see the mid-range, and a step back, you see the high frequencies. And this is made to achieve time alignment, to compensate the different group delays of the drivers. The group delay of a woofer is much higher than the group delay of a tweeter. And these group delays have to be uh, adjusted to each other to make sure that the energy coming from the woofer and the energy coming from the tweeter comes exactly at the same times to your ears. This is not relevant regarding the sound colors. This aspect does not touch sound colors, but it touches very much space impressions in all kinds. Depth of the sound image, resolution of contours, uh, physical impact, and so on and so on. This is strongly related to this time alignment or no time alignment. And all these constructions, these passive constructions, do this time alignment by using mechanical uh, distances and together with the filters, there are some all-pass filters also integrated to adjust it as perfect as possible. So if you look to the energy time curve of the speakers, you will see one peak and that's it. <laughs> and that's the goal, that's what we want to achieve. And so it's up to you, of course, then to judge if this is relevant for you and for, for your uh, sound impressions. But from a technical standpoint, this achieves really a lot regarding resolution, especially regarding all these space-related aspects of sound images. Well, that's it. Has anyone any questions? Go for it. Jürgen, you mentioned the two-way, three-way decision that you made. Yeah. Did you find that when you were testing, if, if you did test three-way with your linear low compression yeah. woofers and stuff. How did that affect the sound? And Could you apply these theories to the three-way, or did you decide, no, two-way with this? Well, I mentioned this 801 from Bowers and Wilkins, which is, in my opinion, a really cool and, uh, and, and, and very elaborate construction using all the knowledge they had in the 80s and uh, Richard Hayes, the time delay spectroscopy and the consequences of this are really well recognized and implemented in this construction. What will be, and this is really a, a high quality uh, a system used in many studios around the world. What will be the difference if you compare it to this one? The most uh, uh, important difference is, I would say, Dynamics, because they do not make uh, this uh, kind of mechanical losses reduction as we did. So the dynamics are different in an 801 in the early version. The late versions do not have time alignment. This is also impressive to see. A uh, Mark IV version of the 801 has not a proper time alignment. The first version has proper time alignment. And if we measure such a speaker like this one, and this is really properly made, you will see if you watch the directivity index, you have strong changes in the directivity index. Because the woofer goes up to around, I think, 480 hertz or so, around this value. And there the woofer also has quite a strong directivity. And then comes the mid-range, which has at the same frequency absolute no directivity. So the directivity index goes low. And then it starts rising, and then comes the tweeter. And in this range, at 3.5 kilohertz, there's almost no directivity, and then it starts rising. So you get this kind of curve. And this is special. I mean, if you check it only on on-axis level, it makes no difference. If you use two, three, or four ways, it's, it's equal, I would say. 
But then, if you take the room into account, then the Which the difference is. The in the world does go into a room, so you do yeah, <laughs> yeah. So then you have the interaction yeah. between the dispersion pattern and the room acoustics and your listening place. There will be. It, then it strongly depends from the room acoustic you have. And even if you do it properly, you will hear a lot of sound coloration given only by this dispersion pattern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, frequency response on axis remains flat, it's good. But uh, given by this uh, changes in the directivity index, you have strong coloration. Fantastic. To kind of carry on from that then, if you're talking about time alignment and all of the energy from the different drivers arriving at the same time, did you experiment with like dual concentric designs? <laughs> it's nice that you asked this question. We had the last uh, in the last session. We had the same question. It's yeah. The opposite question. So the three-way one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I can say, regarding the goal of a of a point source, I would love to build coaxial system, mm -hmm. and I if I could see a clear way how to construct them proper so that they can achieve a result like this or better, I would immediately start developing this if I can see a way. But studying the existing coaxial systems from Ure to Jibia systems uh, to Bema systems and later on 18 sound and many different factors, uh, manufacturers build up such, then you have usually quite a big membrane and in the center you have a compression driver. And if you look for example to, to this horn. This horn makes it possible to go down to 1,200 hertz. But can you integrate such a horn into such a membrane? No, you cannot. So this means that the membrane in a coaxial driver still has to, to rise up to even higher frequencies because the compression driver is not capable to go low. And there's the problem. If you measure such systems, you will see directivity index makes this <laughs> not good. And if you look to the distortions in the, in the crossover range between the big membrane and the, it's usually exceptionally high, three, four, five percent, because they have to push the big membrane as well as the compression driver to the outmost, to the limits. So, great in theory, terrible in practice. Correct, yeah. I would love to have a coaxial speaker, but... Well, well, in a similar way, the, 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 uh, it goes back to how you started off as well. You'd love to have a, an infinitely small speaker. Yeah, produces, correct, yeah. But physics gets in the way. Yeah, Probably. yeah. And I mean, this, this ideal of a point source is not my private ideal. This is a well-recognized uh, ideal in speaker buildings since more than 70 years, I would say. So the goal is clear, and that's why speaker building is not an art, because we have this goal, and we can measure all, all the failures of our constructions. Huh? And in a piano, a failure is maybe something nice, <laughs> and you can use it for your sounds, or in your violin, or whatever. Huh? So these are different areas. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there because uh, we need to obviously move on to the next portion of the evening. Um, we're going to just uh, make sure Eric's is, uh, Eric here is set up and uh, we're going to go for his part of the evening. Um, but I uh, just want to say thanks again, Jürgen, for making yeah. the trip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.